the, uh, it would give you the visibility of the object and uh, the visibility is the Fourier transform of the intensity of the sky brightness of the source. And this visibility is a complex number. So you have an amplitude and a phase. You could play around uh, this way with the Wolfram demonstration I have, I have shown here. So when the source is a little offset, you have an amplitude and a phase. If the source is more centered, like I showed in the first image, a simple source, the phase would be constant. Now, uh, in a real world uh, scenario, in an ideal scenario, if you transform a sky image, uh, you should get this amplitude. And if you uh, inverse Fourier transform, you should get the sky image. But that's not the usual case. What happens is that our uh, aperture is limited and you would be sampling, uh, you wouldn't sample the whole space. So our image might lack in the detail, which is captured by the extra space. Uh, the other spatial frequencies uh, that are not in the center of the aperture. No, so any uh, optical systems, a bit of Fourier transform, you can uh, see this also in cases of camera, uh, say, ARRI disk uh, that you can see when you try to focus on a street lamp. So those are the scenarios function as Fourier transforms. In our radio astronomy, we make use of this principle and uh, and see what uh, not visible to us in the visible part of the spectrum. Why radio is that radio is transparent to us. Uh, uh, we have high transparency for radio. There are still some atmospheric effects, but uh, we can detect a wide window right from our ground and we do not need a space telescope for it like say in the gamma or x-ray range now uh, uh, we, uh since the uh, wavelength is pretty large uh for a good resolution uh based on the Rayleigh cri uh, criteria we need a good diameter and there's a limit as as to how much you can go for example the Arecibo, we had a very large dish but still there are constructional uh, limitations and they might collapse. And so it's better to exploit the other properties. So that brings us to interferometry. We place multiple um, telescopes uh, throughout the globe, even the event horizon, which, is used to which was used to detect the black hole. Uh, those are the examples of inter interferometry where we basically uh, use different uh, telescopes placed throughout the globe to simulate a wider telescope. So how you uh, make this wide aperture is that when the telescopes are just normally placed, you didn't sample much. But since Earth is rotating, we could exploit that. And uh, through time scales, I guess this is eight hours. Yeah. Through eight hours, you could see that the VLA uh, cluster has uh, sampled a good amount of space and you have a clearer image than if the earth was to be stationary and you just focused on a particular area. So that's how we simulate a larger ap aperture. Now, uh, what do we see with radio astronomy? And uh, for uh, first we see the dust, uh, the black body radiation of dust lie in, th uh, lie in the radio range. And you can also see spectral lines like the atomic hydrogen and also uh, lines from molecular transitions. And there are non-thermal sources like the synchrotron radiation. Um, so this can be found in case of pulsars. Uh, the, high uh, the electrons in the high magnetic field produce the synchrotron radiation, which is detected from Earth. And these are detected as pulses every time the axis passes through our line of sight. And uh, recently, they have also used this to detect exoplanets. Uh, we all know how uh, auroras, uh, as uh, charged particles stream through the magnetic field, we receive radio, radio signals. So the 
same principle you can employ it to distant stars and exoplanet system where the exoplanet uh, charge particles from the exoplanet might get strained into the atmosphere of the star causing signals this is a very new paper synthesis and we can also see supernova remnants from these non thermal radiations and beyond uh, the galactic sources you can also find extra galactic sources and for example radio galaxies the jets have a uh, high energy particles and magnetic field causing synchrotron radiation etc and you can also see them in the radio lens uh okay th that's my presentation and i am ending it with an if you as rakels uh, school for this opportunity this lecture was mainly influenced by these uh, two professors keith vandalin and jack lane whose school uh, present uh, lectures on radio interferometry was influential on this <laughs> you have a nice comic there thanks you oh. thanks to you <clears throat> rita it's nice to have you here and you did quite well i think you're going to work on this topic in your thesis? Yeah, I just completed my bachelor's, so mm -hmm. through my master's, I will yeah. be focusing on this. Yeah, good luck with that. Thank you. So let's move on to our second speaker. If you have any questions, meanwhile, do we? <clears throat> okay, thank you, Rita, they say so. Okay, next uh, we have Jose Manuel Casas Gonzalez. Hello. Hi, welcome. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. You may start sharing your screen. Just uh, one moment. Uh -huh. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Okay. Um, well, my name is, well, well, hello. My name is Jose Manuel Casas Gonzalez. I'm a first year PhD student in the University of Oviedo. And I would like to show you the results from our paper, multi-frequency point source detection with fully convolutional networks, performance in realistic microwave sky simulations. In this work, we have developed a mathematical model based on artificial neural networks to detect point sources in multi-frequency realistic simulations. And we have compared our results against one of the most important multi-frequency point source detection methods, the matrix filters, which were used in the plan collaboration. Um, first of all, I will introduce the problem. Um, after that, I will talk about the simulations and the methodology used. And finally, I will show the results and our conclusions. Well, the point source detection is one of the main issues uh, for planning successors, such uh, the PICO, the CMBS4, or the Simons Observatory, since they will have a higher angular resolution than Planck. And as we know, point sources are one of the main contaminants to the recovery of CMB signal at small scales. Therefore, we need to develop more accurate and reliable methods to detect them. The, tra the traditional uh, methods are filters like the Mexican Heart Wavelet 2, which was used in the plan collaboration. But, but this year, Bonavera et al. developed a mathematical model called Poseidon uh, to detect point sources um, in realistic single frequency simulations. Uh, and they compare the results against the ones from the Mexican Heart Wavelet 2, obtaining better results than the filter especially in the much lower number of spurious detections as it, is shown, as it is shown in this figure in the bottom panel. Uh, the multi-frequency point source detection is another issue uh, for plant successors uh, because uh, the, the actual point source detection methods are generally single frequency methods that, cannot de that can deal with uh, the spectral behavior of the sources that is they can deal with the fact that a point source can be a, an, an astrophysical object completely different than the other point sources, in, point sources in the same map, and that they can emit in, a, in a such a variety of ways. 
Uh, therefore, when we do the component separation, which is a multi-frequency process, there are a lot of point sources which cannot be detected by the actual methods. Then we need to develop more accurate and reliable multi-frequency methods to detect them. The, since we, we will have a machine learning model, we will need to train it. And to do that, we will use uh, realistic simulations, multi-frequency simulations of the microwave sky. Each simulation will have uh, two type uh, of images. The first one will have only the contributions from the point sources, which are radio and infrared data galaxies. And the other type of images will have those contributions from the point sources say that to all their contributions acting as contaminants like uh, the cosmic microwave background signal, the cosmic infrared background, the galactic emission, more precisely the thermal dust, the thermal synthetic cell orbits from clusters of galaxies and instrumental noise using Planck values. The patches will be at from now on uh, channel one, uh, which is the 143 channel from Planck. Channel two will be the 217 and channel three will be the 353 gigahertz channels, channel from Planck. And the latitude will be at above 30 degrees of latitude to avoid a uh, contaminated regions such as the galactic plane. Uh, the multi-frequency um, the methodology used is a fully convolutional neural network called multi-poseidon, uh, which works in two steps. The first one is a set of convolutional logs, which make inference over the total input images, that is the images with all the contributions, uh, extracting the more relevant characteristics from them uh, through their feature maps. And the second step is a set of the convolutional blocks, which are joined to these convolutional blocks. And they make prediction uh, about where the point source will be located and which will be the flux density. And therefore, the output from the neural network will be uh, patches with only the point sources. An example of an output from the neural network and for the filter is shown in this figure. As we can see, both methods recover uh, quite well the detection of the um, brighter point sources but the neural network is recovering more sources, especially the fainter ones, because the generalized error of the patch is lower than for the filter. But to study the catalogs properly, uh, we need to use uh, statistical quantities. For example, we have used uh, the recovery of the flux density of the detections, which is shown in the top figures, the channel one is in the left column and the channel three in the right column. We have used the completeness, which is represented in the top panel of the bottom figures. And we have used the reliability of each model to the number of spurious detections, which is shown in the bottom panel of the bottom figures. As we can see, both methods recover quite well the flux density of the detections, especially the neural networks since it is adjusting to the most perfect case, which is the dotted black line. For the completeness, uh, we can see that both methods have a similar completeness for the first two channels. And for, uh, well, um, they are reaching uh, the 90% of a completeness level at lower flux densities than in the plan collaboration, which is represented by this dotted vertical line. And, uh, for the channel three, we can see that uh, the neural network uh, has a higher completeness. Uh, that is, it is recovering more detections than the filter. This is because it is learning uh, where the point source is located with the help of other uh, channels. And uh, for the reliability, we can see that the uh, neural network is a more reliable model since the number of species detection is lower for the three channels than the filter. We have compared uh, the performance of both multi-frequency and single-frequency neural networks. And we can see uh, that the multi-frequency approach uh, has uh, a better, uh, well, it's recovering uh, quite uh, better the flux density of the detections, especially the fainter, the fainter, so the fainter ones uh, for the fainter sources. Uh, since it is, it is adjusting to the most perfect case better than the single frequency approach. And we can see that the completeness of the multi-frequency case is higher than the single frequency case because 
um, because uh, there are uh, more information in the training process and there are the neural network in the multi-frequency case is learning the different correlations between the astrophysical objects in the three patches. And we can see that the multi-frequency approach is a more reliable model in this case too. And our main conclusions are that uh, neural networks can be the future point source detection methods in the next CMB experiments, and that the multi-frequency approach based on neural networks is better than the single frequency one. But we have another uh, interesting conclusion such the lower computation time for the neural networks comparing uh, than the filters, and that they have no deep border effects. And as a future prospect, we can say that uh, we can study the performance of these neural network in regions with higher galactic emissions, such as the galactic plane, or we can extend this study to do CMB component separation uh, to extract the CMB signal instead of the point sources signal. And that was all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for being on time. <laughs> Looks quite complicated. Do we have any questions for Jose? Okay, thank you, Jose. Thank you. Let's proceed. The, the first session, student session is gonna end by Dr. Pietro Oliva from Enough. We're gonna talk about a little bit of history now. Your mic, yeah. Here we are. Then uh, I apologize if my presentation will be a little bit uh, long, but I didn't really have the time to cut uh, what I had to cut. But anyways, we will talk uh, a totally different aspect of our uh, investigation, which is history of the physical representation of the universe. So there will be a lot of image uh, here, images here. Then we, let's start with the words themselves. Of course, physics is what we study. Uh, phys the word physics itself comes from a verb, uh, fuestai, uh, which lem is a fuo. In Greek, it means the birth of the growth of vegetation. And this is, of course, due to the natural selection uh, because our eye is uh, most sensitive to the green. What uh, does the physics study? The really, if you uh, take uh, uh, five minutes and uh, think about it, the only thing that we study is the motion, the motion of things. And the motion of things uh, is created only when two opposite uh, quantities uh, are together. The, what we call in extensive quantity, which for us is the carrier uh, uh, of information, of interest. And uh, there is a, an associated intensive quantity, uh, which is the driving strength for the change. So we define the current by uh, taking the first derivative with respect to time with the, of the extensive quantity, which we call the carrier flow. And then uh, we can define how the energy flows. And the energy flows uh, by multiplying the intensive quantity by the current. And this process always generates a certain amount of, uh, uh, let's say, entropy. And the intensity of the entropy generation, uh, you can find it uh, simply uh, dividing uh, the intensive quantity by the current. And you can play this game with uh, everything you really uh, want to take your attention on. So with the entropy, the mass, the electric charge. So you see in physics, there is this dichotomy and how historically uh, humankind digested this kind of uh, dichotomy, these two opposites. Uh, well, they created the two concepts, the chaos and the cosmos. Normally, we refer the, to chaos uh, when we want to uh, say disorder, but uh, we will see that this is not really the origin of the world, of course. Cosmos, everybody knows, is uh, the or order, ornament uh, of the universe, the beauty of the universe, and Gone uh, is the generation of, of this order. So the cosmo cosmogony is the storytelling of the creation myth, normally of the world, but by extension of the whole universe. While cosmology has the suffix logos, which implies that we are focusing on the structure of the physical universe. 
So these are the depictions uh, of cosmos and chaos. Uh, you see on the left cosmos, uh, on the right chaos, uh, this is a uh, etching uh, on Robert Flood, uh, Utriusque Cosmistoria. Another uh, depiction of uh, chaos, uh, you see a lot of sc scary eye in the middle, but uh, there is also associated to chaos uh, another idea. The idea that the chaos is something unfunctional, uh, as you can see by the Chinese uh, depiction on, on your right. <clears throat> so chaos, uh, uh, it, it, it's really related to disorder. No, uh, originally chaos, uh, etymologically chaos, uh, means uh, abyss. In fact, if you go to North Cosmogony, uh, I'm sorry for the Italian uh, translation, but if you go on the North Cosmology, uh, you clearly see that at the beginning of time, there were no sand nor uh, sea. Uh, the important is the last two lines. The, the abyss was open, Gabbas Ginunga. Ginunga is the gap, is the gap uh, which uh, is the chaos of the abyss. Of course, uh, how do you create the world from, from this abyss of, of nothingness? When you must sacrifice uh, a giant normally, and in this depiction on your left, uh, there is uh, Umir, a giant uh, which is uh, dismembered uh, by Bors' son and created the earth. And on the earth, uh, the first uh, lineage of uh, beings uh, were uh, leaked out of the stone, as you see by the very famous uh, cow, Audumla, which is this uh, big cow, cosmic cow. Of course, the most important son of Bor, a giant, was Odin, everybody knows. But we will find the very same concept uh, around uh, the world. For example, in Vedic cosmogony, there is a Purusha, uh, whose body is uh, made the, the universe. Uh, and uh, please note this, uh, um, this shape that you will find again uh, when we will talk about Mount Meru. But also in pre-Columbian um, civilization, you will find the same concept. You need uh, some uh, being, uh, uh, we, whose body uh, need to be turned into the earth. In this uh, mythology, for example, you have uh, Sipakli, the monster you see on the inside of the water, and uh, Tesatlipoca, uh, which gives his foot uh, to catch the monster and uh, to kill him. Uh, and with this body, we create the, the earth. Uh, there is also another cosmology, Aztec cosmology, Chutli, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, but these names are horrible. And you, you can see in the center, there is this God that uh, sends parts of his body to the angles of the universe. And the details are here. When I, you, you want to see them, I will give you the presentation, of course. Uh, let's move to the main cosmology, which is the Babylonian cosmology. Of course, uh, we are talking about the Enuma Elish. Enuma Elish is when Honai is the first... Uh, uh, for first word, the first line of this tablet, uh, where it's uh, there is the narration of how the un the earth was created, and the earth was created uh, by uh, killing this uh, big uh, giant Tiamat, uh, and from his body, of course, they they created the earth. So the opposite uh, need to stay together, and uh, when there is the creation, uh, need, they need to be split into opposites. In, in alchemical uh, speaking, in alchemical books, this uh, concept of the opposites that are living together are depicted uh, by the rebis, uh, the res bina, the double thing, the male and female together. Of course, you find exactly the same thing uh, in the Chinese uh, uh, culture. Uh, you see the two cosmic brothers, uh, Nu Wa and Fu Shi. Uh, you see uh, these two brothers on, on your left. But here the main uh, point is that the opposite cannot survive if they are steady. They can survive only if they are dynamically opposing each other. In fact, you see this famous symbol, the Tai Chi, that you see on the, on the bottom of the, this diagram. And uh, the very same uh, idea we will find uh, in, in a while in our uh, culture. But then uh, let's uh, try to understand how the Chinese uh, depicted the structure of the universe, the cosmology of the universe. But they need to explain 
circumpolar stars and stars that uh, rise and set. And then they uh, invented this model, uh, which is like uh, the cup in which they put the rice uh, on the other side, up, upside down. And then if you live on such a cup uh, and there is another cup uh, bigger, which represents the, the sky, you can explain the tilting of the axis and also the uh, circumpolar stars and the uh, rising and setting stars. Of course, this is cycle is represented in our culture by this figure, the Ouroboros. It's a snake that eats itself. But uh, you find the same, very, very same depiction in the Hindu cosmology. Eh? This is the Mount Meru, uh, which is uh, the uh, physical universe uh, surrounded by the circle of time. This is again a Mount Meru. Uh, I'm going to skip some slide because of the time, of course. Uh, this idea to have an axis, uh, how this idea translates in the Central European um, imaginary. Well, they created uh, trees, uh, cosmic trees. The most famous of those uh, is, uh, of course, Ugdrasil, uh, which uh, you can find uh, here in the center of the slide. On the right, it's a tombstone, and you can only see Ugdrasil, a very little uh, draw in the center. Of course, the equivalent in Saxon Germanic uh, culture is uh, Irminsul, but it's totally the same uh, idea. And uh, the idea, uh, instead of the map of the Earth, was uh, kind of this one. So you see that one side is uh, more uh, long than the other side, and from uh, this uh, uh, idea comes the word longitude. Let's see. Let's quickly see. Uh, when the man uh, travels around, the, the, explores the world for the very first time, you have to understand that there is a main difference between moving uh, east-west and moving north-south. You cannot really bring uh, with you uh, seeds, uh, uh, agricultural techniques. Uh, so it's very important to understand that moving uh, uh, with the longitude, uh, you can still uh, have the same seeds with you in generation after generation. While if you go north to the south, probably you lose uh, a lot of uh, information coming from your um, ancestries. Uh, so you need, for agriculture, you need a calendar. Uh, the very first calendar you can create is by watching the sun during the years. So of course, the sun uh, move up to the sky uh, from the solar, uh, from the um, uh, equino, from one solstice to another solstice. You see in this uh, 360 degrees picture. And this angle is a function of cosine of latitude. So the most uh, uh, you are close to the equator, the less uh, uh, it's probable that you really build uh, such uh, um, a system to, uh, to have a calendar for agriculture. These are the depiction of the solstice and the equinox. Uh, the etymology, I skip it because we have no time. Let's uh, move to the Babylonian cosmology which starts to uh, create this idea of concentric uh, circular shells around an axis. Uh, of course, the Egyptian contribution uh, is uh, to uh, understand that there is uh, uh, this motion of the sun. Uh, on the left, uh, there is the sunset, the sunrise, and on the right, you have the sunset. And this goddess uh, that creates the sky is Nut. Everybody knows, but then there's cosmology, the structure uh, of the, the Egyptians uh, is this idea that the sky is a flat plane uh, holding on four mountains and the stars and planets are uh, uh, hanging like on a, our Christmas trees. Uh, the Hebrews, which were the working power under the Egyptian, uh, they just took this idea and transformed it into this image of the universe, which is practically equal to the Christian view of today. Uh, but where was the first change toward the modern cosmology? When the first man started to ask that, uh, that these models uh, speak well with the observations. And these men, uh, the only written documents we have, the very first three men is the Thales, Anaximandro, and Anaximene, these three Greeks, uh, of the uh, fifth century before Christ. Uh, they created this kind of model. Teles uh, searched the origin of everything in the water, la arche, the, the very first uh, uh, primordial element. Anaximander, Apeiron, he chose something un un 
undefined, which he called Apeiron, without limits, and Anaximenes, uh, the air uh, is the arche. Anaximander uh, um, embedded uh, in his model also the information of the tilting of Earth axis, so it's uh, quite uh, interesting. The fire, which is the element that is left out, uh, was taken by Heraclitus, uh, which uh, finds the arche to be in the dialectic exchange of contraries, but then uh, we need to move from monism and go to pluralism, so to embrace all the four elements, and Empedocles is the first uh, that did so. So he took as uh, air, earth, water, and fire as elements which were never created, uh, were always, always been there. So let's move to Aristotle. Aristotle takes these uh, concentric shells and create this uh, model based on the idea of perfection of the spheric movement. And uh, we will see that this uh, spheric movement, this need to use the sphere, uh, is the most uh, big uh, trap in humankind history uh, of representation of Cosmo, because we need to wait uh, till Kepler to abandon the spheres. Uh, we move very, very fast. Tycho's system, it's a hybrid between uh, Copernicus and, uh, and Aristotle, of course. And in fact, Copernicus, which everybody knows, and it's considered to be the revolutionary model of the universe, uh, there is a little uh, curiosity here. If you see the Jupiter uh, sphere, it already uh, has the four uh, moons because Galileo already observed these moons. So you see Copernicus brings the sun to the, in the center of the universe, but still the orbits are spherical. So uh, Copernicus is the last of the uh, Aristotelic fellows. Kepler's, as you may know, uh, the big contribution is the abandon, uh, he abandoned this idea of the spheres. Uh, and we are entering in the last part of our journey, the modern ideas, which incredibly starts with the philosopher Immanuel Kant, uh, which uh, for the first time uh, says that our galaxy is only one among uh, many other galaxies. And uh, we have to wait uh, the end of uh, the 700th century for Herschel to build this uh, big, huge telescope and start, uh, start this count, star count survey, uh, which is uh, famous, of course. And uh, Pearson, uh, after Herschel, uh, unveils other galaxies, so uh, Kant was right. Kant uh, created the idea entirely by speculation, but Parson uh, really saw other galaxies. And uh, to have the very, very first model of our galaxy, a scientific model of our galaxy, we have to wait uh, the beginning of the past century with the captain, which by counting the stars, finds that we are in the center of the distribution. This is a story that everybody knows. Of course, Captain make two big uh, uh, assumptions. Uh, this, one of these assumptions was wrong, and we have to wait for Arlov Shapley uh, in Mount Wilson that chooses to count not the stars, but the globular clusters, which are, uh, have 10 to the four, 10 to the five, up to several millions of stars uh, in them. And then you see the distribution is picked uh, toward one direction. Uh, so, of course, we are not in the center of, of anything. Uh, the uh, hypothesis that Captain got wrong, of course, was the brightness uh, drops uh, like one over R squared, which is not okay because there is uh, interstellar dust, there is extinction. And the extinction was uh, ruled out for the very first time by Julius uh, Trampler, which used the uh, Erzsprung Russell um, diagram to do so. so uh, this is the last uh, model that we have today. We understood that uh, more or less uh, uh, we go by this number three, which is a magical number three. We have three uh, parsec, the nucleus embedded in a spherical, three kiloparsec bulge embedded in a spherical uh, 30 kiloparsec halo. So some, sometimes uh, some ideas come back from the, from the time. And uh, this is, of course, everybody knows, this is the last map we have uh, of our galaxy as seen from above. And our galaxy belongs uh, to the local group, uh, which has uh, this distribution. And uh, the funny story is that if we now plot the visible universe, uh, 
Uh, we back in the center because, of course, uh, there is no reason uh, to have a different, uh, uh, different um, view from this one. So uh, from this uh, strange, odd point of view, we are back to the center of our universe and uh, we need the more understanding of our external structure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Petro. It was quite a journey from back then to now. And of course, we're not at the center, but it, it feels that way. <laughs> Isn't that really strange that people back in like 5,000 uh, years ago also thought about the same concepts in Aztec, also in Mesopotamian, about killing the beast and providing the universe for the others. Uh, but they couldn't also contact each other. I mean, how did this uh, myth uh, follow the human race is just quite a challenge, I think. See, for me, the, the very incredible part is that now I had to rush because I had uh, like 57 slides on. Mm. <laughs> so it's You're too right. Much. But uh, the, the main point is that if you really try to understand uh, the link between the cultures is that uh, people really were able to transform translate this information to a civilization to another so the, the important in human history in my opinion is to share information this is the main point and physics is all about the sharing information yes of course well, where they killed contact actually but when they were on different continents and they weren't able to just go to that continent to the new world you know and they were able to think of the same thing as well. I mean, that's human brain, I think. That was the only reason. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Thank you very much. It was quite an introduction, actually, for our history lectures, <laughs> because we're going to continue the history lectures starting from tomorrow evening uh, on YouTube. Uh, Professor Nadir Al Bizri is going to start with. Uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn al Haytam. Uh, and then we're going to talk about observatories in Islam. And uh, every night we're going to have a history of science lecture from now on. So well, thanks again. Let's move on to our next speaker, which is not here. <laughs> Let me check again. <laughs> so he should be. No, I cannot see him. Nope share my screen according to our presentation timetable we should be welcoming Sabah Hussein Kuwaja about solar winds but I don't see him I see Mohammed Baraka in the attendees uh, are you willing to present because I've been asking uh, for you to become a panelist and Baraka, are you willing to attend and present? Okay, that's also fine. You may start, Sobo. Hi, you hear me? We hear you, but we cannot see you. Okay, that's better. We see you now. Uh, are you open it? Okay. Yeah, perfect. yeah, we see you now. Okay. And first of all, I'm uh, Sobol Kik, a PhD student at Le uh, Bocatoire de Physique de Plasma at uh, Paris. Uh, today, I want to present my recent work at uh, investigation of the homogeneity of uh, energy conversion process at the polarization front. Uh, and the first of all, I want just to present uh, my uh, data. It's uh, from MMS data, uh, magnetosphere uh, multi-scale mission. Uh, as, as you see in this picture, uh, my mission just uh, try to study a very simple and very small scale on the Earth magnetosphere. And MMS is, uh, you can consider as uh, constituted by uh, four identical uh, satellites to make uh, a tetrahedron uh, shape. Uh, we try to investigate uh, the Earth uh, magnetosphere uh, with connection with the solar wind or other type of, uh, of magnetic. Uh, 
Uh, especially uh, the main idea of this uh, mission come from uh, a try to study uh, reconnection region on the uh, energy conversion process. Okay, uh, the main uh, concept of my presentation is the depolarization front and what exactly the depolarization front and why we try to study this phenomena and uh, in the Earth magnetosphere. For the first question, uh, what exactly the depolarization front? The depolarization front, you can see it's as a boundary layer, a boundary layer between, uh, between uh, dense, uh, dense, uh, dense plasma at rest and hot uh, tenuous fastly moving plasma, as we can see uh, after. But why we try to study this phenomena and why we think it's very interesting and very important because we think it can be play a very important role in the global energy dissipation process inside the magnetosphere. And this I just present uh, one example of my work. It's for Ananas, as you see in the first panel, we have a magnetic field as as we defend the depolarization front is as a sharp increase of magnetic field and we have increase of, the, of velocity and increase of temperature and we have decrease of density and you can imagine that it says a boundary layer between cold and dense plasma and the whole continuous fast moving plasma and now i just uh, made uh, I want to, to test my data to trust my uh, computation. And the first of all, I made the, the first testing for current density uh, comparison. And the first three panel, I just uh, compute uh, the current density by using two type of computation uh, with, uh, with use two, two different uh, two different uh, data, one of them from particle data and FGM data for magnetic field. And you can see in the first three panel, we have a very good agreement between each of them. And after that, we go for to make uh, another test as uh, to compute uh, whole electric field. And we see here how we have very good agreement between all of them. And that means we can trust and uh, we can trust our data and our computation. And now I just will try to understand uh, the movement of uh, particles. Uh, around my my uh, my events, and you can see here we have uh, we apply Ohm's law for our data, and we found a good agreement between different uh, terms for Ohm's law, and we found a good agreement between electric field and uh, minus V equals P. And in the first uh, figure, uh, that mean electrons uh, most of the time uh, are magnetized. And uh, for another form, uh, Ohm's law from ions, we have another good agreement between all of them. And now we start to take a look for my, my main idea for this work. It's a study of uh, energy conversion process. And the first, is, and the first uh, test, I take uh, an spacecraft frame, as you see, in the first panel, we have magnetic field and electric field and uh, current density. And last thing, we have energy, energy conversion process as, as a term of J bar dot E. J bar is uh, uh, an, uh, J bar dot E. As you see here, we have positive, and after that, we have a negative. And this shape, as a uh, polar shape, we don't see it before. It's just just the first first a first results with MMS mission. But now we we go for more details and we need to go more deeply with this. And we uh, we made another another test for energy conversion process. We compute energy conversion process for average value for average value by using J curve and J bar. In the first panel, we use jcurve.e prime, and you can see here for ion and electron frame, e prime it's electric field plus v equals b. And for electron for ion, you can you can use it. 
And you have we we have a good agreement between J Bart and J E prime. As you can see in the first two panel, we have a negative value. But but now we take for more details another another investigation and we go for more for deeply for that and we check uh, individual spacecraft to see if we have what exactly we have. And when we when we do that. We found a positive value for MMS1, a negative value for MMS2, a positive a negative for MMS4, and that means it's not a, it's not exactly homogeneous, homogeneous with this with this kind of phenomena, and we don't understand why and how. But we go for more details with that to try to understand the non-homogeneity come from where. We made uh, another investigation for standard deviation analysis for electric field and J bars. And what we found, when the first and the first figure for J, J bar, to for you, you can see we have a consist results for J bar from MMS1, MMS2, MMS3, MMS4, for X value, Y, A, Z. But when we apply standard deviation, oh, okay, it's, it's a big value. It's, around eight or seven, that. But what we did, we, we take error bar and we apply it, apply that for our competition and we found it's, it's most around uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, that. And otherwise, you can see in, uh, in another figure for electric feed, okay, it's not consistent. For MMS1, MMS2, as you can see here, MMS4 is positive, MMS3 uh, is negative, and that is not consistent. And you can see that when we apply, we apply the error bar here, we found, okay, it's not so much, it's 1.5 or 2, and that means the non homogeneity comes from electric field, and this is the main idea until now. We found it, and this is a new result. Okay, for for summary, our my work is just we detect uh, uh, events for MMS uh, with uh, classical signature and general properties of dipolarization front. We found a good agreement uh, for the first uh, test for current density uh, calculated by particle and kilometer type, and uh, we uh, compute uh, ions and uh, electrons uh, on slow, and we found all the time uh, electrons can be the couple by electron pressure gradient. Okay, I don't I don't go for more detail with this point. That's okay. And what we found we found. Uh, the ion and electron frame, uh, the energy conversion process uh, can be consist and can be a negative value. But in, when we go for more details for individual spacecraft, okay, it's not it's not always negative. Sometimes positive, sometimes negative. That means it's not homogeneous. And this work uh, submitted and recently uh, it's accepted. I thank you very much for your attention. Please, if you have any question, can you go ahead? Thanks for this interesting talk. Um, I'm, I'm glad that your paper was accepted as well. Thank you. Any, any, any questions? Do we have any questions, anyone? I guess not at the moment. Thanks a lot again. And we'll continue with uh, Onur, if he's here. Honor from Turkey is going to talk about uh, Astrum education. Yep, he's here. Hello, everyone. I'm my name is Honor from Turkey. I'm preschool and drama teacher working in Provisional National Education Office as a project manager. I'm really very really impressed about the presentations, which are really very really amazing. Now I will take you to the basic and beginning of the childhood education and astronomy. So, teaching astronomy, astronomy through creative drama in early childhood and exploration to the space. As you know, uh, today's technological tools and digital contents are became to access easily and the scientific contexts are increasing where with a lot of social media applications and children are facing with the technology often day by day according to the past. So the education curriculum is lagging behind technological innovations. Both parents and teachers don't have enough knowledge and there's a lot of 
wrong information about astronomy concepts, the questions which children wonder about astronomy that they face in their lives are either unanswered or answered incorrectly, both at home and at school. So we are going to teach the basic astronomy concepts scientifically and correctly, and we are going to keep children in a curiosity alive about astronomy with creative drama method in education. Creative drama method is integrating role-playing, gamification, and storytelling together. In early ages, children are learning the world by doing, living, observing, and with the experience. Children meet many fields of science in their daily lives and develop their scientific reasoning skills with their natural curiosity and imagination. Today's little students have a well-developed imagination that should be used in order to become future scientists. According to Turk, the most important issues that children frequently encounter, wonder about, and try to understand in their daily lives are concepts of the astronomy, such as sun, star, moon, clouds, seasons, weather events, and satellites, astronauts, and robots that they hear from their environments. The questions that arise with this curiosity are often left unanswered or maybe answered incorrectly. In these conditions, children can improve nine scientific thoughts. Developing scientific ideas and associating them with daily life is possible to only make teaching scientific concepts correctly. Calorie, astronomy, uh, according to Calorie, astronomical concepts and phonema, which are complex for children, according to their cognitive level, have to be presented with the right strategies and learning styles and with different resources. One of the proper methods used in early childhood to reduce these learning challenges is the creative drama method. In the constructive approach, the learner has to be active in education progress to transfer and restrict the knowledge. In the progress, old and new knowledge are compared, structured, and developed. Another critical aspect of the progress is how to teach rather than what to teach. With the constructive approach, it's important to prepare an environment where children can develop their skills by accessing the data themselves. They need to encounter an enriched process in which they can ask questions, do research, and realize this critical thinking by reflecting on problems. The creative drama method is a teaching method that empowers children to concretize abstract concepts, establishing contexts with their own life experiences, make sense of the relationship between objects and events, and make children active in education progress. It creates a connection between reality and fiction. It keeps children's sense of curiosity at a high level with fictionalized role playing. Learning environment in early childhood are organized from the known to the unknown, from near to the far, from simple to complex. The program that we have created in line with these features starts from the child's daily life and process towards the understanding complex cognitive progress, such as from the earth to the planets. In this program, uh, we have three themes, which are divided in uh, two hours in each team have different activity plans. So at the end of the, this program, we will evaluate the children in three assessments. One is daily activity assessment and the team assessment and the curriculum assessments. In the activity assessments, at the end of the activity, the concepts will be evaluated in the scope of the outputs with daily assessment tests. In the at end of the, each team, children will create and illustrate their own stories with concepts included in the team. And we will use the Earth 2 representation test for the children for the curriculum assessment. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Honor.
it is a pleasure to have you here on this topic as well. And so we have a variety of topics. Well, actually, you should also attend the workshops done by the International Astronomical Union Office of Astronomical Education, OAE. Maybe you can contact later on about that. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. So we have our last student presentation now. Uh, Priya Hassan. Hello Thank there. You. Hello, hello, how are you? Oh, Thank you. Fine. Much. You're ready? Yeah, okay. Yes, I'm ready. You can see my thing. I'll just start the slideshow. Right. Yeah, we can see you. Yes, good? Good? Yeah. yeah. Great. So uh, I'm, I'm to, hello everyone. I'm Priya Hassan. I'm a professor in physics and astronomy at the university in India. And uh, <clears throat> so I would like to actually share with you all the excitement about Gaia and how the study of Gaia is affecting our study of, of star clusters. So, uh, so first of all, let's define star clusters. So star clusters are a sample of stars which basically form from the same molecular cloud, where all the stars have the same age, chemical composition, and are at the same distance. They only differ in mass. And this is typically our understanding of how stars are formed, where stars are basically formed in groups, which are clusters. Now, uh, we have various kinds of clusters. And uh, in the galaxy, you have open clusters, like this, this image over here below, which are obviously stars more scattered, more open around. While globular clusters is what you look at this over here, where you have a much more central concentration of stars. But like I mentioned earlier, these are uh, groups of stars which are formed at the same time, same distance, same chemical composition, and they differ only in mass. Now, <clears throat> globular clusters, like I mentioned, they are, they are compact things. They have a very large number of stars. They are much more massive. And these are typically made up of stars which are much older stars. Open clusters, on the other hand, are looser collection of stars, which are basically made up of younger stars. So these stars are basically blue colored stars, which have an age of about a of million years, about 100 million years. And these are what we call population one stars, which basically occupy the disk of our galaxy. So if you look at the image of our galaxy, we can see the sun is somewhere two thirds away from the center. And if you see the location of globular clusters, they lie in what is called the halo of the galaxy, while open clusters lie in the disk of the galaxy. So the disk is basically where you have spiral arms, where you have young metal rich stars, and the halo is where you have old, older population of metal poor stars. Now, uh, why is the study of star clusters important? That's because star clusters are the basic building blocks of galaxies. And uh, these groups of stars are basically what constitute galaxies. And therefore, if we want to understand formation and evolution of galaxies, we need to understand star clusters. And uh, therefore, we need to understand various star cluster populations, which could range from what are called young associations, open clusters, as well as globular clusters. So, <clears throat> Uh, Lada and Lada were a very seminal paper where they actually proved that stars form in clusters because typically you find young stars always in clusters. And like I mentioned, star formation occurs from these molecular clouds. And then as time progresses, these clusters dissolve or they are destroyed by interactions with the molecular clouds or tidal stripping by the gravitational field of their host galaxies. So uh, star clusters have a finite maximum lifetime which they have after which they disperse off, right? So typically stars like our sun, for example, which have an age of about 9 billion years, they probably formed in a cluster at some point of time. But now, since it's already, you know, 4.5 billion years old, the group in which or the cluster in which the sun was formed has dispersed, it's evaporated. Now, the issues in studies of star clusters are the biggest issue is the problem with membership. And how do we know that stars in a particular region of the sky belong to that cluster? So there are various methods of determining membership, kinematic, spectroscopic, as well as photometric, this thing. And therefore, you cannot have a 100% guarantee about stars, whether they are members. And this is also very important if you want to find interesting kind of objects and clusters, you uh, this thing, and they could always be field stars if you wrongly identify these stars. The other important thing about star clusters is that these star images which you see, these are dynamic images. All these stars are moving. They are not static as they appear in there, these things. So here I have an example of, for example, the Big Dipper, where you can see that each star actually moves 
okay this animation is not on but each star actually moves and therefore we need to have precise measurements of positions as well as movements of stars to basically determine what are you know what are their positions and movement and that's what is called astrometry and how precisely do we need to measure it we need to pressure it if you measure it with the accuracy of a size of a an uh, of a of a second of arc that's approximately the size of a euro coin that viewed from a distance of 5 kilometers or you do it with a thousandth of an arc the size of an astronaut or the moon or you do it with you know even further precision now we'll come to gaia gaia is a mission where we are actually measuring astrometry to a few microseconds of arc so uh, the astrometric uh, observations we've been doing have been improving with time so these are the naked eye observations and then we have improved with it further with hipparchus as well as gaia so space astrometry is the way to go about you send a telescope in space so that uh, movements in the atmosphere do not spoil your readings and with that you can very accurately measure astrometry and get absolute astrometry so hipparchus was the first astrometric satellite in the 1990s which actually observed about a million stars accurately measuring their positions as well as their velocities so the space velocity of stars can be separated into two forms one is what is called the proper motion from which we can get the transverse velocity of stars and then there is the radial velocity which we get from spectroscopic measurements of the stars right so typically when we actually observe these motions of stars we if you look at a star from the earth you will see one motion is what is called parallax which is due to the motion of the earth there could also be proper motion because the star's orbit there can be wobbles if there's a planet going around the star and there could be a combined motion of all this which is like what is seen with gaia so gaia was a satellite which was launched which was this thing by esa it's an esa satellite which was launched so that it could accurately measure for a billion stars their astrometry right and uh, what gaia does is it go, it sits at the l2 point which is the second lagrangian point at a distance of about 1.5 million kilometers from the earth from where it observes these billion stars of our galaxy and um, so this is the approximately position of gaia which is the l2 point these are the five lagrange points when which the gravitational force gets balanced and gaia sits at l2 from which it gets shielded by the earth from the sun and from here it observes the sky so it appro approximately observes every star it looks observe, uh, approximately observe it about 70 to 80 times and get accurate measurements so with gaia we have a six dimensional revolution where now we can actually look at stars get their ra their deck their parallax their radial velocities and their proper motions in ra and deck and this set a very high accuracy which we spoke about which was a micro arc second and uh, with this we can very accurately measure and therefore gaia has gotten a total revolution in the study of our galaxy where we can accurately measure the distances as well as the velocities of stars and uh, various objects in our galaxy this will also go on for exoplanets for uh, quasars so the range is very large from exoplanets to stars to quasars to various objects which are mentioned over here and therefore the gaia database will give us data for a billion stars with the distance and velocity distributions of stellar populations in the disk as well as the halo it gives us a very good insight into the formation history of the galaxy extrasolar planets and solar system bodies also in our neighborhood as well as very accurately helps us observe objects in the lmc the smc supernova bright sources quasar detections and various such objects so um, i'll end with this and uh, that is the basic uh, revolution which we are expecting in us in the study of the milky way with the advent of gaia thank you thanks a lot priya it's quite an overview in a short time and we are also excited about gaia <laughs> yes do we have any questions uh, we are coming to an end to it today i guess everybody's getting tired a little bit <laughs> okay thanks a lot again so i'm going to now share okay just to remind you uh we're going to close up today tomorrow morning 
We are going to start with mixing processes in stars. Mauricio is going to take us into the stars. And then we're going to talk about uh, stars as astroparticle laboratories. And then we're going to talk about a little bit of supernova producing elements with INMA. And then I'm going to talk about some stellar abundances and we will have more presentations tomorrow. And in the evening, we is going, we're gonna have a, a history of science YouTube uh, stream but we can also attend this YouTube stream via this Zoom link here. So if you don't have any questions, I will see you tomorrow morning at 7.30 universal time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks for the nice Thank talk. You. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Thank you. everyone for their Thank you. talks Thank today. You. Thank you. Ciao. See you tomorrow. Ciao, ciao. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.